Uh, technology showcase number one is going to be presented by Tommy Kalthoven. He's among the sponsors here, uh, Vice President of Sales with Unmanned Systems and Autonomy at ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems Atlas Electronic. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Also ich glaube, ich glaube. Yeah, um, we do have a, I'm told, a microphone under here, which would be of great service to us, uh, I'm told. Want to try that? See if it works. Okay. Doesn't work either, does it? Well, golly, we could try a little song and dance number, couldn't we? No, I, um, I, I, yeah, I hope it's going to be working in a second. I, I'm sure a technical crew back there are working on this feverishly. It's working. It's working. And can I see the presentations as well? Let's see, maybe you're, is it t test one? Test. Mic check, one, two, three. No, no. Okay, then we go for that one. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it may seem unusual to some of the audience uh, that a company like ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems shows up on here. Uh, I think if we are through this presentation, uh, it hopefully doesn't seem that weird anymore. Um, yeah, in general, there's more to ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems than the submarines. And uh, even more general, there's more to ThyssenKrupp than Marine Systems. What you see in here on this slight introductional video is uh, one good example for that. Uh, this is the CCAT system of Atlas Electronic. It's a 100% subsidy of ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems. And we are, in some ex to some extent, the world market leader for naval mine countermeasure systems. So uh, hunting for sea mines is in our DNA for various decades already. On the other hand, uh, naval shipbuilding comes with some special capabilities with respect to shock uh, and detonation engineering capabilities uh, to secure, uh, to make a naval ship as secure to uh, the people on it uh, as even possible. And on the second hand, and by all these summing up, uh, we are certified according to the German uh, Explosives Act, according to paragraph seven, and have uh, several trained and skilled uh, paragraph 20s in house as well. When we started having an analytical view on uh, a potential process of uh, munition dump site clearance. We had on the one hand capabilities we looked at, we could add to the, uh, to the whole uh, strategy of the market by our own portfolio. On the other hand, we were looking into the market quite deeply on what are the capabilities around there by potential partners or, or other companies on the market. And we identified some things we identified as a gap and this was the ambition to close these gaps. So what you see in here is uh, what you've already seen in animation. And this was one big challenge we tried to face to keep up with market available technologies as even possible. The main goal was not to reinvent the wheel. So what you see here is our AOV solution. We have two of them, uh, there's many more built, but two of them are rented out to commercial operators as well for meanwhile like four years. And, and by our history, uh, munition clearance is for sure one of our big targets with these systems and capabilities. What you see in here is a picture from the Kohlberger Heide. Um, yeah, next stage was how to remove uh, stuff. And this is by far not our challenge. But uh, when designing uh, the whole platform around the market given capabilities, we had a look into various technologies that are uh, on some degree ready and are still evolving, but uh, we investigated already good capabilities with respect to munition removal. What you see in here is the so-called multi-tools provided by several partners out there already. And on the other hand, uh, and I'm pretty sure that I met Dito Goldin already, you will learn about crawler systems uh, even more these days. Yeah, and we've identified that also crawler capabilities are already really on a good way, giving us the impression that uh, it's worth getting into the process and sorting up whatever comes afterwards, removal. And this is where we start our task. And we've learned these days about the sheer masses uh, of uh, munitions down there at the sea. So our approach was to reach a high level of automation. 
And when it comes to automation, uh, we also talk about standardization. And it's clear to all of us that munitions after 70, 6, 80 years on the seabed is uh, far away from standards. So we try to uh, look into these uh, kind of cages or pallets or however you want to call them. And the intent is to provide those as standards to our partners and, and SMEs uh, who uh, thrive around this whole uh, removal capability and have the intent to use a kind of utility rough, which is kind of market proven technology to recover them relatively or to bring them to the surface relatively automated by securing them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we try to avoid this additional handling when bringing the munition from the seabed to the deliberation process. So this cage you see in here is more than just the storage box. It is also part of the whole deliberation and cutting process as it is the table already. So when we looked into this processual chain, we had on the one side market proven capabilities for detonation chambers and off-gas treatment systems, the so-called ovens, uh, which big capabilities, the biggest ones have capabilities up to eight kilos uh, of ammunition. And on the other hand, we have uh, uh, sea mines or torpedo warheads with 250 to 300 kilos of uh, TNT equivalent. So there was a gap and there was a step in between we had to close. Um, on the land side, you're doing that in a bunker. So if you look into these companies like the GECA, they have these bunkers, they do the cuttings, this is stuff that is done today. But how to get a bunker on a ship? And this was the big question, and uh, as I already introduced, we have this staff of engineers who is involved with these whole shock-proven systems, with detonation engineering around ships. And this is part of the shipbuilding DNA of ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems. And uh, when it comes to detonations, the core task is uh, handling the gas, and handling these huge masses of gas. And this is because this is how detonations are bringing their force into the metal. And what you see in here uh, does look quite cute, but this is uh, approximately 100 tons of uh, steel and filament. So as we identified this kind of bunker system as one of the most critical parts on the whole process, uh, it was not a distrust in our engineers, but we were aware that we someday hopefully talk about kind of uh, bringing that system into the market and having kind of a discussions with state authorities and what we are doing here and is it really safe. So from the early beginning, and what you see in here is, was one of the early iteration loops in, in early 2020, uh, was that we teamed up with another company from Munich uh, who has similar uh, simulation capabilities when it comes to uh, detonation engineering. But it's same, same, but different. So they took a really different approach to that topic. And what you see in this first iteration loop is that this box is opening uh, at a 500 kilo uh, detonation uh, simulation. But lucky to us, and this was part of the engineering process, the whole structure failed on the same position. So and this happened two to three times, so we were sure that the simulation approaches from both companies were somewhere in the right direction. Uh, I mentioned already that there's more to Tusen Group than marine systems. And um, when you've seen these famous pictures from car manufacturer facilities, there must be a pretty good chance that you've seen a picture that has been integrated by Tusen Group Automation Engineering. So we've teamed up with these colleagues uh, and started a kind of a systems design approach on how to deal with robots. And building a car is not an easy task, but we have some special challenges to face. So especially when we talk about water cutting system or water jet systems like the ones from a &T. Uh, we talk about uh, corrosive atmospheres, we talk about uh, dust and, uh, dust and, and, and water spray and all that stuff around. And we were lucky to identify that there's already robots on the market that could deal with this type of uh, corrosive environments. Further, you have pretty market standard, these kind of shunk exchange systems where you can nearly automatically change from one tool to another. And there is not a &T water cutting as the, per the sole solution. There will be various tools in the process from detector systems, x-raying systems, which are all already integrated to this type of industry robots today. So, and when it comes to the, the final goal uh, of uh, disposing systems, uh, we had a lot of talks, hours of talks and conceptual work uh, together with uh, the Swedish company called DynaSafe, which may be known to some extent to some in the audience. 
And what you see in here is a kind of simulational uh, process flow of uh, an SDC system. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, the munition approach is, the, uh, is elevated to the top, getting into this uh, detonation chamber and is falling in. So there's already more, and back to the initial goal I've addressed, uh, staying within market available technologies uh, so far as we can. And uh, those type of uh, DynaSafe systems are, yeah, let me say the main solution I would address them, maybe it's wrong, as the market leader for this type of systems. Uh, and those systems are in several stages around this world, in operations and in service. Yeah, the biggest ones uh, up to the specs could deal with up to around eight kilos of uh, TNT equivalent. Yeah, and the outcome, and at the end of this process is a big, it's like I think five containers of 20 foot equivalent, uh, is an off-gas treatment which is already accepted uh, on the land side by German authorities. I have no clue how long I've taken, but I think I'm done. Thanks for the audience. Your, your timing, your timing was, was excellent. You actually have a couple of minutes because you started five minutes late. So if you want to, if you want to take a question, uh, we would have time, but there's so much there that I'm sure people want to know about. Uh, any, any quick question before we move on? Otherwise, we'll make up time moving forward. So uh, if you have a question, this will be the time to raise your hand or approach the microphone. Um, I would love to talk to you myself about uh, lots of aspects of that, but we've heard uh, the term industrial scale uh, solutions uh, a couple of times at this, at this uh, uh, Kiel Munitions Clearance Week already, and, uh, and this gives us, I think, some insights into what that might look like. Uh, go ahead. You're going to have to speak loudly. reason why you do not start tomorrow with the Kohlberger Heide. <laughs> uh, I, le I left off a slide uh, which is uh, on the slide deck, I'll just move from my slide deck to the slide deck of Dr. Royano, uh, who is here on the panel on, on Thursday, um, where we've built up uh, a kind of a processual chain where we said we've taken, or all of us have taken a lot of steps. You uh, did some great work with respect to raising the awareness on the topic and describing the problem. Klaus and the Melon did proper jobs with quantification of the problem. So sensors developed, removal technologies developed, and uh, now this was, from our view, the last missing link to that topic. Yeah, simple thing. Uh, we've heard that uh, several times these days. We need the piloting project. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, very quick. This is a model, but it's uh, based on, on yep. proven technologies and, and integrating stuff to uh, two floating platforms is kind of core competency of a shipbuilding company. Um, this on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, maybe these simulations, and I've seen this self on my presentations when we talk about these chambers. That's 100 tons of steel. Just one chamber. And this is uh, a scale of 70 by 26 meters. That's, that's big. No, no, why? Okay. Yeah, it's happening, we're building, we're building cities, we call them cruise liners with 10,000 people on board. And this is, as a naval architect, what I think is weird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so, we, we're moving along. We're staying fairly much on, on track here. I'm, I, I wish we did have more time, but unfortunately we don't. Uh, otherwise, it would be unfair to, to, the, to the following speakers. But perhaps you can ap approach uh, him okay. afterwards and, and, and address your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, technical difficulties aside, we are uh, making progress and learning things. Um, and I'm sure we're going to learn something quite interesting from our, our second technology showcase speaker. Um, I'm going to leave this up here just to, uh, for you to use in case your microphone is not working. Arne Schwenk, uh, another one of our sponsors, representing one of our sponsors here. CTO at KUM Umwelt and Meerestechnik Kiel GmbH. Uh, that's 
I'm sure most of you know what that means. It's basically <laughs> environmental and, uh, and ocean technology. Thank you. Oh, it's working. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, maybe I misunderstood the term showcase. But anyway. Um, yeah, so thanks for the opportunity that I can speak here. I'm, uh, I'm very delighted um, to be here. And I'm very, very delighted on the conference at all. Um, it's a highly... Um, high quality conference so far, and I very much hope that I do not drop the standards. <laughs> okay, is there, uh, do I have here? I have. Okay, the, the problem, you're all aware of the problem, I believe you have heard around about 1.6 million times that, uh, how much million tons are dumped, so I will not repeat it. Um, I have no screen here, I don't know why. Doesn't matter. Okay, um, part of the problem is that um, we know the locations where munition is dumped from archive records, uh, but we do not know exact locations. So if we talk about meters by meters, we don't know what's there. And we also don't know what's inside the baskets, as one of the, the speakers beforehand uh, said. So we know there's an object. We can detect the objects uh, with uh, magnetometry and bosimetry but we don't know exactly what it is. Um, we also don't know um, the distribution, so we know it is there and it's there, but in the depths we don't know how much it is and we don't know the state of the system. So if it's nice and shiny like built yesterday or if it's already corroded and TNT is going to get into the water within the next weeks. Um, TNT is what uh, we wanted to do with the project X-Protect together with uh, the GEOMAR, Aaron Beck and Mario uh, Esposito. And they mainly had the idea to build this, this machine that I'm, I'm presenting here. Um, what I've done before to measure the TNT concentration in the sea um, was that you took manual samples, you took bags of water, you took lots of bags of water, hundreds of bags of water on the ship um, with, a, with the vessel and put it into the lab and sign it with the GPS location and what water depths you have taken it. Um, after days offshore, you go back to the lab, you pre-concentrate uh, all, all your water, you um, do little samples and then you take these hundreds of samples and put it in to a, a mass spectrometer. Um, and finally, after weeks, maybe after months, um, you get the result of what you have collected weeks and months before. So you have a, a little map with some, some spots and, and uh, there you can um, have a concentration on there. Um, what we have done during the last two years, one and a half years, and what will we go forward is that we build an um, instrument uh, that is fully automated. Um, this is one of the core components of the system. This is a pre-concentration unit with a sampling inside. This is lowered into the water, and you can see the, the black ones on the table, below the tables, this is a mass spectrometer. So the system is below the, uh, the ship or is transported by an uh, ROV, and it continuously pre-concentrates water um, has one sample inside. Uh, this sample delivers the concentrated TNT concentration to the mass spectrometer, and after 15 minutes, you get a measurement. And then you, uh, this, you re repeat it. And so you can, every 15 minutes, you can get a um, TNT concentration online. There's no need of changing the sample. There's no need of changing the filter. It continuously works. And this is not an idea. Um, this exists. We have done so. This is part of it. And on Saturday and Sunday, some of you have had the luck to uh, join a cruise where it was demonstrated. What we will do in the next years is that we, of course, commercialize it, that, that we harden it, that we uh, make sure that, um, that it's um, um, 
even more reliable than it, uh, this is now. So nowadays we can collect 100 samples before we have to maintain the system. So one idea is to put it in a buoy and have some sample hoses in different uh, water depths and place it around the dumping area, uh, like Kohlberger Heide, and uh, to measure, continuously measure um, the TNT concentration. And when we see that the concentration goes up from one day to another or two weeks, then we know, okay, now we really have to act. So the idea is to, um, that we can build up a heat map, a kind of heat map, hotspots, and so that we know um, that something is changing in where we are. Um, the system is equipped with a mobile phone or a satellite phone, so it completely automatic works. It has that energy on, on, uh, on board, and so this is future. Uh, the other one is existing, uh, but this is future what we can think about. Um, fields of, of application could be verification of the dumping sites and detecting new sites if they are some, somewhat uh, in the water and it's detected by a bathymetry, you can check if it's TNT around there or not. And as I said before, um, building up a heat map and to f give more knowledge to the people who want to dispose it, which are the hot sites they have to dispose first. And we have learned in, in, in the morning and in the afternoon that um, knowledge faster knowledge and more economical knowledge of the um, TNT concentration in the water um, is really important. And I was sitting there and listened to all, all the people, listened to, uh, to the speakers, and, it, and, and in my mind I made it, okay, I can hear you, I can hook it. And I was really excited about this because this system um, rapidly um, decreases cost, rapidly increases the time until you get the knowledge you need. And it's very much scalable. Numbers. What do you mean by in numbers? The cost. Uh, of the system now or of the system in, in, in the future? Well, we estimated uh, that a boy, you can see here, including the energy and the hose and, and samples, you have to maintain every three months. And it's around about 400,000 euros for the first pilot. Okay, yeah, so I'm finished, and I'm free for questions. <laughs> so. Um, so far, I don't know exactly, I have to ask Erwin for that one. Um, it's on any of the samples we got from everywhere on the world, we have been able to detect TNT. So it's far better than the milligrams per liter that's needed to, um, to see if it's, if it's really dangerous for um, the env environment. I believe it's 10 nanogram per liter. Aaron, can you confirm this or give me a number? One nanogram per liter TNT. Great. Uh, just, just thank you very much. Um, yep. And don't, don't go away, because uh, we still have a little bit more time. If you okay. If, um, and we do see people lining up at the microphone, which is where I would ask you to please uh, address your, your question, and not from, from sitting in your chair, because the online audience simply can't hear you, and we want to include everyone. So, uh, yes, gentlemen uh, at the microphone. Yeah. Thank you for this great uh, presentation. Um, Paul Müller, Fraunhofer, ICT. Um, one question, um, how did you solve the problem um, with one sample not influencing the next sample, um, speaking of contamination, that you don't measure the TNT from the sample you had before in it? Yeah, uh, so this is not only a system to, for qualifying TNT, it's also for quantifying TNT. It's validated and it, it has samples uh, for calibration inside, so you can uh, either by automatic or, or by remote control, uh, tell the system to calibrate itself to a certain amount of, of TNT inside. Okay, so uh, you have a new uh, zero line after each sample. Exactly. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so the system at the moment is aiming for explosives. Uh, do you think it could be? Uh, 
uh, enhanced to, with the capability to detect chemical warfare agents and the degradation products? Yes, yeah, so because it's working uh, with a mass spectrometer, you have a pattern for TNT, and so it's able to detect TNT. And if you change the pattern and the programmation of, of the system, signals, it doesn't matter. So it's DTNT, it's, it's um, I believe you could measure shrimps or, so, or something if you want to. So yeah. it's, <laughs> if you know the pattern. So that's yeah. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> More questions? Absolutely fascinating um, if, for me too. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not a scientist and I'm, my specialty is not munitions, but we've been talking a lot about monitoring, uh, how yep. to monitor, how to detect, uh, how to measure you know, the metrics that we're going to use. And it does sound like the, you know, this could be a, a big leap forward. So um, yep. yeah. I'll, um, Sure, no more questions, and we'll move on to the next speaker. We did, would have another, um, I can imagine a lot of people in this room might have questions, perhaps they'll approach you. But, okay, uh, maybe uh, later. Personally, yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Arne Schwenk. So, our third, oh, look at that, yeah. Is that heavy? Oh, it's empty, so it's not that much heavy. Uh -huh. <laughs> if it were full of shrimp, I'm sure it would be. <laughs> Okay, our third technology showcase uh, with Friedhof, uh, Friedhof, Jop, yes, Friedhof, Friedhof Henemann, uh, yeah. CEO of True Ocean GmbH. You, I'm sure many of you know this company. It's a software company striving to digitize the ocean and related maritime use cases. Yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the audience. Also, I have the pleasure and honor to wrap up a little bit the day. So it's also an obligation because it has been a very intense day already. A lot of information, some, a lot I've learned. So I try to keep my presentation concise and draw you a little bit back from the focus on very specific use case like munition to a more holistic view, first of all, on um, submarine data. So we, as True Ocean, we digitize the ocean and maritime use cases and want to do so by a software as a service platform for submarine sensor data. We is a, a technology startup from Kiel, founded just two years ago. Um, we gathered a team of uh, not only international, but also interdisciplinary um, uh, software developers with backgrounds, obviously, in computer science and data analytics, but also in geophysics and hydro hydro hydrography. Sorry. And our key competences are in web applications as we will build this platform in the cloud. And in big data processing, scalable cloud computing, of course, so we can use the resources and data management. Before I dive into this, I would like to show you this fact sheet of our beautiful blue planet. I think most of you are aware, but I, I like to keep this uh, facts in the back of my mind, talking about submarine data. So it is a 361 million square kilometer surface covered by ocean. And this is the cover of an ocean space of 1.35 billion cubic kilometers. So this is really, really huge. And this ocean contains 97% of all water on the planet. It uh, is habitat of 230,000 species known it has an average depth of 3,700 meters. This is, of course, much more deeper, much more shallow, of course, and an average wave height of three meters. Why am I saying this? This is a challenging environment, very dynamic, very deep. So it's not an easy space we are talking about. And it's a very um, important climate agent because it is the main machine and heat and water circle on, on the planet Earth. So keeping this ocean facts in mind. And then, of course, we have also use of the ocean because we have a lot of livestock in there. We use for nutrition, other commodities, medical, cosmetics. We draw our energy from it. Hydrocarbonates, yes, but a gaining number of renewables, luckily. And other resources, minerals like copper, cobalt, just to name a few. And then the main challenge is, again, dynamic environment. And we have literally no optical 
um, observation because there's simply no light that makes it so difficult. Furthermore, we have a lot of trends which is pushing us into the oceans. We have the growing world population, and the growing world population has demand for communication and transport, and today we do this majorly by digital means, and we all want to have e-transport, so we need resources again. And of course, nutrition, we have to feed all the people and transport. Then again, we have uh, climate and decarbonization challenges. We have to decarbonize our economies. And um, there's a growing number of initiatives through renewables, just to name these ones. And they have high demand for information of submerged. Digitization and uh, IoT, so Internet of Things, can help us a lot to push this. And from the other side, we see uh, a striving amount of uh, autonomous sensor platforms which will carry sensors to collect this data. We will have newer and more complex sensor generations and the coverage of 5G, hopefully one day, and satellite coverage by multi-billionaires from the US, they will come up so the data transfer will be, become easier. That's the trends. So nonetheless, we have still less than 20% of the ocean floor mapped and even less in a sufficient um, scale. And this is driving me to two, two major problems we have. The one is data acquisition in this very dynamic and very uh, um, challenging environment which causes high costs. We, I have a huge variety of sensors and therefore also an even larger variety of data formats. Um, I collect big data vol volumes and they're feeding in constantly in a growing data stock. So on the other hand, I need good means for data processing. So having my data available is the only way to work with this in a sufficient way. I need computing resources to get this in a performant time and analysis solutions. And what I want to have, I want to reduce data transfer. What becomes big, I don't want to transfer. In ocean um, uh, applications, as we saw throughout the day, there is a lot of need for um, information on the floor, so I keep this short. We know one very good reason, which is unexploded ordnance. It could be boulders and other things, so I need to know um, about the seafloor when I build and invest there. Um, but how is marine sensor data handled today very often still? I do, I do uh, save my data in data silos. This is not very good, so I have it located in different places. I have limited access to it, so my working with this is limited. I, use very, I, I have to use many proprietary data formats. For this, I need specific software to read it. I have to transfer data from silos to the end user, which is causing time and which is waste. Very often, I have it very in, inefficiently saved and unsafely stored, even on physical devices. Yes, I know, there is other cloud platforms, Amazon, Microsoft, people start to transfer the data there, but still there's also uh, manual data processing, which is also causing a lot of time. If we want to scale, and this was also some word I heard before, and just to name, make an example, renewable offshore wind is driving to have a plus of 700% of the to today existing capacity in Europe to be built globally in the next 10 years. Wow. This will need some good efficiency scale up to reach these goals. We believe that um, platform for submarine data could help a lot because we strive to enable data users First of all, to connect the people working on this, so collaboration, to connect the people to the data that I have it available and can work with this. I think we all know Microsoft Teams quite pretty well since the last one and a half years. To bring data to sufficient resources, like I can provide in cloud and scale, and also data to, to algorithm. Because, and that is an important thing, I don't want to then transfer again. So we are uh, delivering these um, data, but I try to keep it short a little bit. So I jump already to give you just a little bit of expressions. How could this look like? On the very left, you see a capture 
of something, a data management. This reminds you pretty much of an explorer. So this is how you can nicely organize the data. You know what you have and where you have. You can organize it in, in projects. It, it will always be related also to some kind of an interactive map that the geolocation is clear. And of course, also visualization. So to wrap it up, digitization fosters industrial scaling. Why is it so? I enable the users to work with the data directly. I automize processes. This will boost efficiency by um, beating down costs and bringing us deeper insights and enhance our knowledge in the end. So what we try is actually to be the intersection between the offshore application and the already existing infrastructure as a service person, because I do not only want to manage and store and share data, I want to work with data directly in the cloud. And this is, I think, the main value in it, because I don't want to download data again. This costs you money, the downstreaming. Then I have it again in my desktop uh, application, and there I don't have sufficient resources very often and no performant uh, processing. So we strive to do the data analysis directly in the cloud. So what you can then do there is uh, work on quality assurances, object and event detection, change detection, data combination of different sensors, and data processing pipeline where you can already apply your own um, applications. Just to give you an idea of how this could work then and also support here on uh, munition detection, we currently work on a technology. We basically look on um, 3D uh, point clouds directly. Uh, and try to initiate an object detection direct on the point clouds, which can then later help to identify, optimize um, this project to identify objects in the data I have without transferring this in a two-day mosaic, for example, direct in a 3D point cloud. Another use case example is also to do this with uh, magnetic objects, um, to have here the optimized identification when I have an AUV driving to measure the amplitudes, and then later if I have if I have tagged amplitudes to pinpoint again with another AUV to verify what I have found. So use cases will be then the value in the platform later where we will are where we are looking for partners to develop this very specific solutions in these use cases. We provide the platform the means and the software to work in there. And with partners, we develop specific use cases to analyze data so I don't have to download again. Here are some examples of object detection, marine infrastructure, asset monitoring, and another um, technology monitoring of uh, carbon capture and storage, site monitoring. And we are heavily involved also in research projects where we also gaining more um, use cases and specific knowledge of data analysis. The one on the very left is the Project Rasmus, uh, where we look in surface ocean currents and um, combine these ocean current models with AI algorithms to predict on uh, periodically upcoming current solutions and have a better route optimization of ships to uh, decrease fuel consumption and therefore CO2 emission. In the middle is, again, the um, carbon capture and storage measuring, monitoring, and verification tool. And, and not on the very right, a project we will hear a little bit more about on tomorrow morning session, which is MySpace X. MySpace X is a project we will start in January together with a larger group um, uh, to build a data space for the marine application uh, in the framework of Gaia-X to have a new approach or um, in, in uh, um, other than like uh, a new approach on data sovereignty, data safety, and data portability, other than you have it like with the uh, cloud providers from the US or in China. But we will hear about this a little bit more, and I keep it short. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm ready.
Thank you very much, Friedhof uh, Hedemann. That was fascinating. How to deal with the data, a huge question uh, indeed. Questions, uh, we have a couple of minutes. Yeah, I see a gentleman approaching the microphone. Yes, uh, thank you, Fritjof. Uh, it was very nice to see what you guys are doing because I was always, uh, <laughs> to be honest, struggling to understand, uh, and now I have a much better picture. Um, the use cases that you showed are all very innovative and very new, um, but in fact, there are also many, many use cases already lying around, but they're just being executed um, locally on people's local machines and not in the cloud. Yeah. So are you also planning on inviting all these hundreds of software providers who already have these solutions which are now running on people's machines locally to develop uh, plugins for your, for your platform? Absolutely, that is also um, a case we are looking into something we call uh, expert modules which uh, they can then implement on our platform like in the marketplace when they do not have this kind of dis distribution platform. So the idea here is, uh, first of all, we are generating a platform for everybody who is a data user because they all have the generic needs for storage, for management, for access control, um, for administration of the data. And then to add the value of actually particular and very specific analysis, we have to work together with other partners. And there's a lot of experts also here in the room who have specific analysis capabilities. We are the persons who can also transport this into the cloud atmosphere and the software environment so that their customers have the, uh, the value that they can upload the data and process it in a cloud infrastructure on a scalable way. Yeah? And one thing you also mentioned is so we try to uh, uh, make it possible that all kinds of data, submarine sensor data, can be uploaded. And very often, you have this proprietary formats. We try to convert it into a generic uh, file format that uh, you are not longer um, reliant on specific proprietary software to read it. And this will be an open source format, so you can also transport it back from the platform again. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think I see well, one more question coming. So, okay, just yeah. one more, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up with that. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the question is: uh, Will you be able to work with the files that you do not upload uh, to the cloud? I mean, uh, prior to publication, scientific data mm -hmm. are protected uh, in many cases, in yes. many projects. So then you have to process them, and usually you use offline systems to process your data to prepare like plans for next phases of experiments. And uh, people are using like very outdated but uh, trustworthy tools like Open Data View. Every oceanographer knows that uh, because you can work on your machine, uh, meaning that you do not move your data outside. Will it? Will it be possible with your system as well? Um, to answer your question in the first way, we are absolutely aware of the fact that everybody with proprietary data will be very reluctant to share in the first place. Yeah? So we provide you a workspace in the platform which is totally secure and under your control. And this also will uh, be developed in the framework of Gaia-X, so you have full data sovereignty and control, uh, no any terms and conditions will tell you I will use it anyways. So this will not, is not going to happen. Okay, the idea is, is in a later stage, we believe that people and maybe even in industry applications who store bigger amounts of money will um, experience over time that storing money in the cloud, of course, is a cost factor. And every CFO at a certain point looks at costs and say, can we do anything about this? Yes, you can. If you feel that your, um, it, uh, your data is not that delicate anymore, you, you could share. And you have a proper overview on your metadata also that you can really give a reference what you have. Somebody else could be very interested in your data because it contains information they can use, for example, for cross-verification for your scientific work. 
So and instead, to buy it somewhere or get some downloads with very uncertain quality level, you can buy it to a fraction of the price than taking your own survey. survey. But this is future. Yeah, OK. And Great. I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave it there. I've, yeah. I've just been told in my ear. But I'm happy to discuss afterwards. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what's going to happen right now, too. We're going to have a, an opportunity to do some networking. So perhaps you can ask the, the question to, to you. Thank you so much, uh, Friedrich. It was my pleasure. Thanks. Thank yeah. you.